Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to open up God's Word with you this morning. If you don't know, Pastor Wes and Lisa are currently in South Asia and having a great time over there, a great time of ministry and of travel and seeing some people. And it's an encouragement to me, I hope it is to you as well, that we have a senior pastor who not only encourages us and challenges us every single week to go, week to go to the nations, but he does it himself. He leads by example. And I'm going to tell you, if you haven't been to South Asia, it's a hard trip, isn't it, Bose? It's a hard trip, all right, to get over there. And so I really appreciate them doing that and setting that example. So if you would join me this morning, a time of praying for them and also for our church. Heavenly Father, we come to you and just are so desperately in need of your grace and your mercy and your provision, your kindness, your goodness, your everlasting love. And Father, you've poured out lavishly all those things upon you. Thank you for the privilege of being your bride, the church. Thank you for the calling that you've given to us, Lord. You haven't called us to complacency, but you've called us to take the gospel to the nations. And you haven't just called us, you've equipped us. And Father, may we be a people passionate for your glory. May we be a worshiping community. Father, the reality is, even though we know we've been saved from our sin, we still live in a sin-filled world, and there are many struggles and pains frustrations, illnesses, disease, death that impacts us on a daily basis. And I know there are many in this room this morning who are struggling with that, wondering, Lord, how, how to get through the day. Father, what a great encouragement it is to be your child, to know that we don't have to get through the day on our own, that you have carried that burden for us, that sin has been defeated that what we experience here is only the fleeting attempts of the enemy who has been defeated. Father, may we be emboldened by your mercy and your grace. May we be a people who rejoice in all circumstances, knowing we're not defined by what is going on around me. We are defined as our identity is found in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, may we never forget that. May that be the message that's always on our tongue as you send us out into our workplace, into our schools, into our community, into our neighborhood, into our homes. Father, proclaim your goodness over everything. Well, we do lift up Pastor Wes and Lisa to you. Thank you so much for the safe travels you've given to them, the effective ministry they've already had. Lord, no, Pastor Wes is preaching today over there. And what a blessing it is to have a senior pastor who will Travel 10,000 miles, Lord, for the sake of the gospel. So, Lord, we pray you give them effective ministry there. And, Father, open up our hearts here to recognize the same gospels at work everywhere in your world, and we're being challenged to the exact same calling. We praise your holy name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be continuing in our study of the gospel of John. We'll be reading a passage starting in John chapter 4, verse 27. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles and be turning there, we'll get there in just a moment. But for the past few weeks, Pastor Wes has been leading us in kind of a look at Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. And we see that Jesus, is, Jesus was very intentional and very missional in his interaction with this woman. And in our text this morning, we're going to see that Jesus was not only intentional with her, but also used this very encounter with a Samaritan woman to be intentional with his disciples and to instruct them in missional living that sustained through a lifestyle of worship. Now, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, they themselves got into a conversation about worship. And in this conversation, the Samaritan woman showed that she, like many others now and also then, had an incorrect view of worship. See, this woman believed that worship was geographically specific and it was culturally defined. And we see it in her saying this, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And Jesus responds to the statement on worship by telling her she is missing out on God's true blessing because she is incorrect in her understanding of what it means to worship God. And we see Jesus speaking to this in John chapter 4, verse 22. He says, you worship what you do not know. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And when Jesus speaks here of worship, he makes it clear that worship is neither geographically specific nor is it culturally defined. 
Rather, the opportunity, the responsibility for worship is in every place, it is at every moment, and it is based on the truth that God has revealed himself and who he is to us. Church family, this same challenge is to us. We can be tempted to understand worship as being geographically specific. It happens in this room once a week when we gather together and sing some songs. We can also be tempted to think that worship is culturally defined. It has to sound this way. It has to look this way. None of that is the case. Worship is all about God. It is not about us. And so we cannot define it based on our parameters. In his famous missiological book, Let the Nations Be Glad, John Piper says this at the very opening of the book. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship does not. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. And again, what we see in this is that true worship is centered on the very character, the nature, and the revelation of God. So for us to be missional, which is what we've been called to be, we must first be true worshipers because we have been called to make true worshipers of the nations, to make true worshipers of Jesus Christ. So when the Samaritan woman heard Jesus speak of this true worship, her response was actually fairly profound because she acknowledged the fact that it's not possible to worship like that without help from the outside. And this is what she said in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And really, what she just said is what we also believe, that it's only in Jesus that true worship is even possible, for it is he who has revealed the Father to us. It is he who has given us the spirit of truth in which true worship is even possible. So we also, like this woman, seek to know what he has declared to us. And here's the good news. He has declared much to us in his word. But perhaps his greatest declaration is the final one that he made to his disciples when he gave them their greatest calling. And we found that in the Gospel of Matthew at the very end, the 28th chapter, something you're very familiar with. The mission statement of our church comes from this passage, but it's one we can never hear enough because it is the great calling that Jesus Christ has given to us that instruct us in true worship. And this is what it says. And Jesus came and spoke to the disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, listen, Jesus didn't give this calling to the unprepared. He gave this calling to his disciples, who he had been investing in for the previous three years, modeling and teaching to them about true worship, which they were now commanded to multiply in the nations. And in our text today, it provides a great example of Jesus doing this very thing with his disciples, of him explaining to them and teaching them how to move towards this calling of missional living as worshipers. So if you found our text, again, John chapter 4, verse 27, I'd invite you, if you're able, to stand with me in honor of God's word, and we'll read the passage. God's word says this, At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went to the city and said to the men, Come and see, a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that our hearts will be open to receive the truths that are in it, because we know your word never returns void. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. 
So our text begins with the disciples returning from an errand that they had been given to find some lunch. And as they return, they find Jesus engaged in a culturally odd, if not even taboo, conversation with a Samaritan woman. And as soon as the disciples arrive, the woman quickly makes her exit from the scene. But Jesus takes advantage of this perfect opportunity to teach his disciples about worship and missional living because they had caught him in the very act of both of those things. And so the first aspect of missional living that we see in this passage is that worship provides the proper perspective for missional living. Look with me, if you would, in verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what are you seeking, or why are you speaking with her? So the woman left her water pot and went to the city and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? And they left the city and we're coming to him. You know, there are many things that influence our perspective, and we all have a perspective. Sometimes we call that our worldview. It's just a few of those things that can influence our perspective is our culture, our prejudices, our biases, our religion, even the very location where we live. And our perspective influences the way that we live our lives and also how we engage the great calling that Jesus has given to us. Many of you know that I grew up in the Middle East, and as you can imagine, my experiences there influence my perspectives, even to this day. And one example of that is how I understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. All right, here's the reality. I understand that based on living right in the middle of it and having personal relationships with people who were involved in that conflict. The typical American understands that conflict from 7,000 miles away. Now, that doesn't mean my proximity to that conflict means I have a more valid understanding of it, but what it means is it's going to be very different. My experience is my understanding will be very different because I was right there with it than someone who observes it from 7,000 miles away. So when I moved back to the States and I started to, understand, started to hear about the American perspective of my conflict, it surprised me, especially when I heard about it in the church. I really struggled to understand it. Now, over the years, I've come to understand it a little bit better, but the reality is my 14 years spent in that region have impacted my perception, my understanding of that conflict. And it's going to be different than the average American because of those experiences. Well, the same thing is the case with the disciples. The disciples' perspective, when they saw Jesus speaking with a Samaritan woman, was influenced by their culture, by their prejudice, by their religion, and by countless other things that we don't even know about. And they were seeing this encounter very differently than Jesus was. And these influences were most certainly demanding a response from them. They wanted to say something. They wanted to speak to Jesus about the inappropriateness of it. But there's an even greater influence at play in this circumstance, in the lives of the disciples. And that influence is the presence of Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus would later tell his disciples in that great calling that we read in Matthew 28. He would say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And that authority existed in Christ's presence in this very moment. And it had a profound impact on how the disciples responded to the situation. So I want us to look at at three different ways Christ's authority speaks into the situation. First of all, in verse 27, we see that Christ's authority silences the other perspectives that were present. Notice it says the disciples were amazed. Now, this is not a good amazed, right? This was, what is he doing, right? He's going to ruin us. And so they were amazed because their perspectives were causing them to evaluate this missional encounter, which is what Jesus was having, and judge it as inconsistent with their expectations. Yet, no one said, Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, why are you speaking with her? Jesus, do you understand what you're doing is not appropriate? No one said it. They probably wanted to, but they couldn't. They were silenced. And they were silenced because of Christ's authority. They understood that their perspectives had no right to question Christ's intentions because his authority is greater than their perspectives. Man. Church family, I hope this challenges you as much as it challenges me because I have to ask myself, do I allow Christ's authority to silence the noise of my perspectives? Because I have many perspectives, and they've been influenced by many things other than Scripture and Christ. Does Christ have the authority in my life to silence those perspectives? And if he doesn't, am I forgetting that he's present? Because when Christ is present, his authority is there. 
and it demands respect over everything else. But secondly, what we see, verse 28 and 29, is that Christ's authority also breaks down barriers. So this woman left her water pot and went to the city. We know from earlier in the passage that this Samaritan woman came alone to fill her water jars. And that was most likely because her lifestyle, her actions, had built up barriers in her own community that caused her to keep a distance from others. She wasn't able to be in community. She wasn't able to share with others. She was isolated. But we see in this passage that Jesus' authority caused her to leave her water jars. She came out there. That was a symbol of her isolation almost. She came out alone. She left it, went back into the city, and she declared to the villagers, she said, come and see. Could this be the Christ? You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we've all most likely built up barriers that keep us from engaging others with the gospel. Those barriers could be fear, it could be busyness, they could be prejudice, laziness, pride, you name it. Countless things, barriers we've built up. But do we believe that Christ's authority can break down those barriers? This woman did. She was able to put aside her water jars and go directly into the village. Are we willing to surrender those barriers and be able to say, Christ, Christ's authority declares that I go and his authority is greater than any barrier that tells me to to stay, to not go. And then thirdly, in verse 30, it says, Christ's authority defeats doubt. It says they left the city and were coming to him. Let me tell you, there was absolutely no reason for the people of that city to listen to this woman. Instead, they had every reason to doubt and to ignore her testimony. But Christ's authority shone through her testimony. Christ's authority was in the power of her testimony. And so Christ's authority penetrated the doubt of those people. And the response was they went out of the city. As far as we know, the entire city did. Left the city and were coming to him. You know, a lot of times we can say, I'd share with that person, but there is no way they're going to believe. Their doubt is too strong. You're right. We can't convince them to leave, but Christ's authority can penetrate any excuse, any doubt, anything that would hold them back. How dare we limit the power of Christ's authority with our doubt? So we must let Christ's authority, first of all, penetrate through our doubt and trust that it will penetrate through the doubt of anyone that he calls us to declare his gospel with. So church family, let's understand Christ's authority should silence the responses of our worldly perspective. And it is in worship which is acknowledging his eternal presence amongst us. He is always here. It's in worship that we recognize his authority and we allow it to be the dominant influencer of our perspective so we see with missional eyes everywhere that we look. But in our passage, we don't only see that worship provides the proper perspective. We also see that provides the true provision for missional living. Look with me in verse 31. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You know, we're all often anxious about our provisions. We always ask that question, will we have enough for blank? And it really doesn't matter how much we already have. It seems to be no matter how much we've accumulated, have how much wealth, we're still always anxious about that which we, we don't have. And so that's just the reality. And the reality of life is not that we need provisions. That's not the question. We know we need provisions. The question we should be asking ourselves is are we seeking the correct provision and are we seeking provision from the correct source? The Samaritan woman was concerned with the provision of water. And she was willing to go to great lengths to get it. And we understand that because water is needed for life. It's estimated that a human being can live no more than three days without water. But I guarantee you, you're going to think you're dying of thirst long before you get to the end of three days. It's also estimated that three to four million people die every year due to lack of access to clean water. Most of those are children. And the majority of these deaths is not related to thirst but it's from the water that comes from the wrong source, a source ridden with disease. And here's the thing, the desperate flock to those sources that are ridden with disease and bring death. And so the Samaritan woman, without a doubt, her decisions in life 
had made her pursuit of the provision of water even more difficult. And when, so when Jesus came to her and, and offered her this living water that would eternally quench her thirst, she was quick to say, I want that. Give that to me. Because she knew the source she was going to was, was not effective. And she was having to come back and back and said, I want that. I want that perfect provision. We also look at the disciples. Disciples were concerned with the provision of food. Now, food's also needed for life, but a person can live much longer without food than they can water. It's estimated one to two months. But I guarantee you, for all of us in this room, our definition of starvation is we stay at church past 1230, right? And trust me, most Sundays I'm in that congregation with you. I hear your stomachs rumbling, and mine's doing it right there with you. That's the true choir of the church right there is the rumbling of the stomach. And the reality is our bodies beg for this provision, and they long before we actually desperately need it for life. We, we long for this provision. But you know, the disciples were very, even more often concerned about the provision of food. We can see in Matthew 14, they were concerned with how to feed the 5,000. You're familiar with that story. There are 5,000 men plus women and children. Jesus was teaching them getting late in the day, and so the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, you need to send them home. They need to go get something to eat. And Jesus said, ah, you feed them. All right. Jesus, we've got a couple of loaves of bread and fish. We're, not, we're going to be hungry at the end of this, just the 12 of us. How are we going to feed everybody? And we know what happened. Jesus worked a miracle right before them and, and more than satisfied everyone. But just a little bit later, chronologically, this couldn't have been long at all. In Matthew 16, we see Jesus in the boat with his disciples. They're traveling somewhere, and Jesus starts to teach the disciples to watch out for the teaching of the Pharisees. And he uses the term, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Well, when the disciples heard that, you know what they thought? Uh-oh, we forgot to bring, bo- we forgot to bring bread on the boat. Jesus is getting on. Because, you know, we do that, especially as parents. We try to get to our kids kind of roundabout. We're saying this thing. We want them to experience guilt, so we kind of go over on the edges of what they really want to say until they finally get it. Well, that's what the disciples thought Jesus was doing. Oh, we didn't bring bread. When Jesus, of course, knew what they were thinking, he was like, what are you doing? I'm not talking about bread. Do you not remember what I just did? What happened with those 5,000 people? Peter, what happened? Well, they all got satisfied. And then what was the remainder? He did the problem solved. What was the remainder? A basket for each of us of leftovers. Exactly. It's not about food. But despite that, we see the disciples couldn't seem to shake their anxiety over the provision of food. You know, a few Sundays ago, we were observing the Lord's Supper here. And that Sunday morning, we recognized that we had miscounted the elements. And we weren't sure we had enough for everybody in all of the services. So we got all that we had, and we put it out, and we were just watching it service by service. It was dwindling and dwindling. The deacons were getting nervous and anxious about, are we going to have enough? Gary Jackson kept saying, Ben, where are the rest of the elements? And I don't know. We don't have any more. So they're dwindling. It's getting to the end. We're at 11 o'clock service. I think we're going to run out. I think let's go get some jars of water. Let's have the deacons pray over it. That God will turn this water into grape juice, and we'll just keep going. We're getting desperate, but we made it. Everybody had it, and we had about a handful left over at the end of it. But you know what? As you remember, Pastor West always asks at the end of the Lord's Supper, have all been served? And the answer is no, all have not been served. And our resources seem so small against the massive scale of the need to serve the world with the gospel. And we get anxious about it. God, how, how can I meet such a huge need? But you know what? Jesus wasn't concerned with any of these things. Earlier in in the story, Jesus had asked the Samaritan woman for water when he first encountered, can you give me some water? Well, guess what? She never gave him any water. But Jesus didn't care. He wasn't concerned about that. Most of us would, and he was probably thirsty. He'd been walking, it's dry over there. He didn't care. When the disciples came back with food, they said, Rabbi, eat something. You gotta be starving. We were starving. He said, I'm satisfied even though they knew he hadn't eaten a thing. And Jesus was willing to sit and spend time with one Samaritan woman and speak truth to her when there was a whole nation that needed to hear about the kingdom of God. And Jesus knew his time was not forever on the earth. He knew the urgency of it, and yet he spent it with that one woman. And Jesus did all these things and lacked, he wasn't anxious about any of them because he knew where his provision came from. He knew his provision was to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And in this provision, all his needs were satisfied. Not just taken care of, they were satisfied. Now, there's a reality. We are finite creatures. We are in need of provision. But the degree of satisfaction that we receive from the provisions we seek is directly related to the type and the source of the provision that we pursue. 
We're all pursuing provision. Jesus gave us clear instructions in Matthew 6 on the provision that we are to seek. And he tells us if we will follow these simple instructions, then we will have no need to be anxious. And in everything, we will experience no lack of provision. And this was the instruction. Seek the will of the Father. That's what Jesus did. Seek the will of the Father. Matthew 6, verse 25, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. Church, we serve the king, and we live in his kingdom. And his provision is without limit. And even better, he has promised to resource his people perfectly. And when we worship the king by seeking to do his will and to pursue his righteousness, then we will be perfectly resourced for missional living because the king is always faithful. But worship doesn't only lead us to an understanding of missional perspective and provision. It also provides the priority for missional living. Look with me in verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I tell you, raise your eyes. Observe the fields that they are white for harvest. You know, there are many things that compete for our priority in our lives. And we have to be very wise to understand what is the highest priority if we're going to live missionally. If we don't understand the highest priority, there's no chance we're going to live missionally. And unfortunately, too often in our desire to live missionally, we've made preparation the priority. Do you know that there is a never-ending list of books out there on how to prepare for the calling that God has given to us? And we love to encourage each other to read those books. We love to have study groups on them. We love to write papers on them. We love to post on social media how many of them we have read. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying there's no value in these things. I read many such books, but we must ask ourselves if reading and discussing books and having endless classroom sessions on missional living, is that really the highest priority for worshipers of the God who has called us to live missionally, not study missionally, not get smarter missionally, to live missionally. In his book, Spiritual Multiplication in the Real World, kind of irony there that I'm quoting a book after I just said that, but there is some value in it. McNabb says this, we're addicted to the classroom. The church has lost a biblical approach to equipping the body for ministry. What we wouldn't dream of doing when earthly lives are on the line has somehow become standard operating procedure when it comes to dealing with people's eternal souls. And what McNabb is saying is that we need to stop spending so much time preparing for what we know we've already been called and equipped to do, and we need to start being obedient to the calling. Preparation is important. Don't get me wrong. We should not abandon preparation, but preparation is not the priority. And all of our preparation should have the true priority and focus, which should be pushing us to passionately move towards that highest priority. So what is the highest priority? Well, Jesus tells us what it is. He says the highest priority of missional living is action. Jesus said, raise your eyes. I can almost hear him say from your books and your classes and your small groups, and observe the fields that they're white for harvest. We're not waiting for the ideal circumstance. It's there right now. And laborers are being sent out. So how do we make action the priority? Well, I think, first of all, we we start by praying passionately and expectantly. You may say, wait a second, Ben, isn't prayer part of the preparation? I thought you said we need to quit doing preparation. We often think that. We often think that prayer is preparation. That's not at all how Scripture sees prayer. Scripture sees prayer as the targeting of action so we're not aimless in action. You know, sometimes what happens is when we feel like we've been guilted into doing something, we just do anything. I'm going to tell you, just doing anything is sometimes worse than not doing anything. And so we don't want to just go and take action that's aimless, but that's not what God's called us to. And so that's why we pray. But we don't just sit there and wait. We pray as we are going. That's what the Great Commission is telling you. As you're going, do all of these things. And so we pray. Matthew 9, 36, Jesus seeing the crowds. He had lifted up his eyes. He could see the crowds. 
He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead. He doesn't say, hey, God, if you have a chance, God, I'm going to ask you this. I know you're busy. No, he says, plead with the Father. Plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So the very first step in making action the priority is to get on our knees before God and ask him to send missional people. And who are missional people? They are those who live, who have the perspective of Christ's authority, and they have the provision of God's calling. And we're praying that God would send them to go to the harvest fields of our community, of our nation, and of the ends of the earth. But as we're praying, the next part of action, as we're praying passionately and expectantly, we do what Isaiah did. And he offered himself to God's priority. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah said, I heard the calling. It was crystal clear. And so he said, here am I. Send me. He didn't say send Jeremiah. He didn't say send Ezekiel. He says, send me. I'm volunteering. McNabb calls a person who understands this priority that Isaiah exemplifies, he calls him a world Christian, not a worldly Christian. It's actually the very opposite of a worldly Christian. A world Christian is one who, fueled by his own passionate worship of his Savior, has made God's global purpose of bringing every nation to himself the overmastering and unifying ambition of his life. Worshippers understand this priority. They understand the priority of missional living is prayerful and surrendered action in accordance with the purposes of God. Then lastly, we see that worshipers are a missional people, or those world Christians, a community of like-minded laborers. Look with me in verses 36 through 38. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the one who sows and the one who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have come into their labor. You know, we all love community, right? And, and we celebrate community here at First Baptist Rogers because we know the value of community. But I'm gonna tell you, we're not called to just any kind of community. We're called to be a community of worshipers. And our priority must be the pursuit of Jesus and his mission with missional community being the product of that pursuit. See, it shouldn't be our end goal shouldn't be that community. It should be the outcome of what we are pursuing passionately. Acts 2 speaks of such a missional community. And we in the church often go to Acts 2 to see what's the example. What should the church community look like? And this is what it says in verses 46 and 47. Day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved, transformed, lives changed, delivered from sin, brought into a community of believers who were missional because they had one mind on worshiping God together. Passionate pursuit of Jesus results in missional community. Michael Stewart, who was the pastor of missional community at the Austin Stone Church, he says this about our desire for Acts 2 community, because when we read Acts 2, all of us want Acts 2 community. He says this, when you aim for Acts 2 community, you will get neither community nor mission. But if you aim to pursue Jesus and his mission, you'll get both mission and community. Church family, we have been called to be passionate worshipers of Jesus so that he can make us the missional community that he has called us to to be. A community that worships the Father in spirit and truth. Not worshiping the Father in a geographical location, this room once a week. Not a congregation that says my culture determines what worship looks like. No, a community that worships the Father in spirit and truth, always, everywhere, for his glory, according to his revelation to us. A community that makes Jesus' authority our perspective. 
We have lenses that we see everything through his authority, which is in heaven and earth, and a perspective of the Father's will as our provision that he has perfectly provided his community. A community that's looked up to see the fields white for harvest and have made prayerful and obedient action the priority. It is my prayer that we would all hunger and thirst for this community.